My name is Chris Parker. I'm an oncologist at the Royal Marsden in the UK. Um, and here are my disclaimers. And also the standard disclaimer for this type of meeting before we go any further. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite Karim to come up now to give his presentation on new treatment possibilities after docetaxel. Uh, I think we, we've just uh, been living very exciting years for prostate cancer research uh, in the recent past. That's been really exciting to, to be uh, a GU oncologist. And this is because we have now four drugs that could make it to improve overall survival in the post-dostaxel setting. Not even not talking about cell T in the protostaxal setting. And actually, I don't see any other cancer with uh, so many good news in the recent past. If you look at the data, cabazitaxel, abiraterone, radium-223, and finally MDV-3100 could improve significantly overall survival in the postostaxel setting. Let me summarize this data uh, rapidly for you. Uh, Cabazitaxel was the first drug to uh, achieve such uh, an improvement, 30% reduction in risk of death when compared with mitoxantrone. The difference is obviously significant. And if you like to see the median, it, it comes from 12.7 months up to 15.1 months for the Cabazitaxel arm. So first positive trial. And this is a chemotherapy agent. Abiratron obviously was the second drug to demonstrate such an improvement. Abiratron is an androgen biosynthesis inhibitor, so completely different mechanism of action. And here again, as you can see, the overall survival moved from 11.12 months up to 15.8 months, and this is approximately a 26% reduction in the risk of death. Radium-223, this is a bone-targeting agent, a radio farm, so again, a completely different drug as compared to the uh, two previous ones. And radium-223 was compared to placebo with demonstration of overall survival improvement with a risk reduction of approximately 30%. And again, the, the median overall survival was 11.12 months in the control arm and it, it was improved up to 14 months in the radium-223 arm. And very recently, we had a Ford compound that could make it to improve overall survival, MDV-3100, as opposed to, as compared to the placebo, 18.4 months median overall survival versus 13.6 months, 37% reduction of death. So four compounds, and at least three of them have completely different mechanisms of action, so we can hope somehow that the benefit could be incremental for all the patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Karim. So we've got four topics we're going to address now, and I'd like to ask Christos first of all, um, why might you want to use cabazitaxel first and abiraterone second? Okay. Um Although we don't have hard clinical data to support the sequence yet, yet uh, we can make assumptions as to which patient population the androgen under the receptor axis is least likely to exist or be functional. And that's the clinical phenotype of what we call now aggressive phenotype or anaplastic. And that includes patients that either have a very short-lived response or no response to androgen deprivation therapy, less than six months usually. Those patients that uh, have uh, presence of visceral meta metastasis, Patients who have predominantly lytic bone metastasis, or patients who have B symptoms, that is um, fever, um, loss, weight, weight loss, and sweats, and patients um, who have other indices, uh, who have disproportionately low PSA compared to the tumor burden, or patients who have other markers of disease activity, such as high LDH or neuroendocrine markers of differentiation. This group of patients with either uh, constellation of these uh, parameters would be, I think, uh, most benefited by aggressive treatment because they are high growth rate and, as I said, least likely to respond to the androgen deprivation therapies. 
And I suppose another argument would be those patients that were older or frailer and were borderline fitness for cabazitaxel, you might want to give them cabazitaxel while you can, rather than give them abiraterone, wait for them to develop progressive disease, by which time they might not be fit enough to have cabazitaxel. Um, Heather, the opposite question, why might you want to use abiraterone first and cabazitaxel second? As we've already established, there's no correct sequence from the data that we have today, but I think there are some patients who perhaps are not suitable for chemotherapy, either because of their performance status, or perhaps they don't want to have chemotherapy and they choose to have abiraterone. The, I think abiraterone has some advantages in that it's a tablet. It can be given away from the cancer centre, which makes it much more accessible to a wider group of patients. It also has a very favourable toxicity profile. So I think that on the whole, you can anticipate the side effects of abiraterone, which means that we know how to treat them. And my personal experience is that it's been extremely well tolerated. It isn't limited to cancer centres, it isn't limited to patients having intravenous infusions. They can lead much more independent lives without the concern of neutropenia or other side effects. I think importantly, the, the 301 study did show benefit with abiraterone for a wide group of different clinical situations, including bone pain, including visceral metastasis. So I think this is a choice for all men after docetaxel, chemotherapy, and I think for many men it would be a favoured choice. I would completely agree with you that sometimes there is a narrow window of opportunity for chemotherapy, and for those men with aggressive disease that we need to be careful not to miss that window, and then they're unfit for chemo in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Heather. Um, so, Giuseppe, um, let's say that your patient is on abiraterone after docetaxel, um, how are you going to monitor him? How often would you see him? What tests would you do? What sort of toxicity problems would you look out for? As previously stated, said, castricio resistant prostate cancer represents a heterogeneous group of patients with different metastases, with different symptoms, with different quality of life, with different pain. So the three parameters that are very important to monitoring during the treatment is, are the symptoms, the lesions, and the PSA level. So it is not different to evaluate the efficacy uh, among the two uh, drugs. So, in my opinion, um, I can um, use a um, TG scan and boot scan every three months. Also, if I treat with abiraterone or if I treat with cabazitaxel, but it's different the toxicity profile. So, I need to evaluate a different in different time the toxicity. So, I need to evaluate in different time the symptoms. Because if the pain, have, uh, the patients have the pain, I can monitoring the pain every month. If the patients have a, a poor quality of life, I can monitoring every month. And another point is the PSA level. So uh, we have uh, we have found we find two type of a patient: the patient that show a slow PSA increase and the patient that is show a rapid PSA increase. So uh, the patients that show a low PSA level, I think that we can continue the same treatment and monitoring after one month. Um, if the patient show a rapid PSA increase also um, associated with them, um, um, in a poor quality of life, an increase of a pain, I think that it's important to stop the treatment. So Giuseppe, I perhaps should have explained myself more clearly. What I was wondering is about monitoring for toxicity, not monitoring for efficacy. So what side effects would you look out for in somebody on abiraterone? 
So uh, the, uh, the I, 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 I look the side effect with on every two weeks. So monitoring uh, um, hypokalemia, um, hypertension, and uh, liver, uh, liver test function. Um, a different is with chemotherapy. So uh, with chemotherapy, often we can monitoring also the um, hematologic, hematological uh, toxicity. So uh, it's a different profile and uh, it's it's a different uh, mm -hmm. toxicity evaluation. And, and if your patient develops problems with a low potassium or with high blood pressure, what would you do? How would you manage the problem? But I, I, it's important to treat the, uh, the, the effect. Depend of the, the, the rate of hypertension, depend the level of uh, hypokalemia. But I can um, use and supportive uh, care to uh, increase the uh, potassium or uh, reduce hypertension. So you, you give potassium supplements, you treat the high blood pressure, and you carry on with abiraterone. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And moving on then to Ignacio. Um, at the moment, as of today, we just have two drugs approved in this space, cabazitaxel and abiraterone. But let's assume for the moment that radium-223 and MDV-3100 also get approved and become available. How, how will those drugs be used, do you think? Okay. Thank you for the question, Chris. I think it's a key question, actually, and which is obviously not answered yet. That is relevant not only for us as physicians, but probably also to the uh, regulatory authorities. So I, I think let's just get into this situation. Imagine you know both drugs have been approved. Um, where would I see, let's start with the last one, radium-223. Well, if we look at the population of patients that were treated in the study, it was a mix of patients post docetaxel, but there were also patients who were considered unfit for docetaxel. So probably there, you know, is where I see this drug that demonstrated a better quality of life, a better overall survival in these populations. So if I had to tell you a right or a precise answer right now, I would say I would choose my unfit patients for docetaxel. Probably would be good candidates to be treated with radium-223. That would be the, the simple answer. If we talk about MDV-3100, I think the answer is much more complicated. We have two drugs, abiraterone acetate, with a very particular mechanism of action, is an androgen biosynthesis inhibitor, and then we have MDV-3100 acting on the androgen receptor, both demonstrating a benefit in survival. Probably the difference is that the data from abiraterone is quite solid from the th uh, 301 study, and now we're waiting for the 302 study. And the key question that all the oncologists are going to be looking at, or all the physicians involved in prostate cancer management is, okay, how do I select which patients are going to benefit from one drug or the other? We don't have those predictive factors yet, but if you ask me, how do, you, how do I see this in a few years? I probably see that we will have data for abiraterone in both the post-docetaxel and the pre-docetaxel setting. So that is going to give you know, abiraterone a very relevant role, and MDV probably will be only competing in the post-docetaxel, where it's probably going to make its own little area. So that's how I see it, pending the data from predictive uh, factors. So you think most patients will get abiraterone before docetaxel and they'll get MDV after docetaxel? That is an option. That is a possible scenario, looking at the data and the approval times and all that, because I think we'll have shortly the data from the pre-docetaxel setting with abiraterone, so there probably will be a shift soon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.